Wow, now I know why God connected us for him to be here today. Um, yeah, how powerful was that? Um, we're running a little bit behind schedule, but we've got one last speaker um, who's going to speak to us for just a few minutes. Um, he is uh, Cliff Muncy. He is actually with the, uh, he is the director of media at America's Remedy. He's got a table set up over here. Uh, America's Remedy is a nonpartisan educational think tank with the goal of shedding light on the origin and the negative impact of nationalized citizenship. Their focus through education and legal activism is to reestablish America and her demi-sovereign states on a free and constitutional foundation. It's not just history, it's America's remedy. Amer uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Cliff Muncy. Hello, I'm Cliff Muncy. I'm director of media at America's Remedy. You can see our uh, tent over here. I know it's getting late in the day, and I appreciate your time and attention. Um, with that being said, I'd like to ask, before you leave, please don't leave before you go by our table and get some information. We've got some flyers and an event coming up, which I'll tell you about in just a moment. I'd like to say thank you to the organizers and the speakers here. I appreciate what everyone has said so far. I've found so many that we are on the same page with, and I really appreciate what's being said. What better thing to do today than pray for our country? You know, the Bible talks about knowledge. Hosea 4.6 tells us, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. James Madison, father of our Constitution, also believed knowledge was important. He said, Knowledge will forever govern ignorance. Today, I'd like to tell you about one way in which I think we are being destroyed for lack of knowledge. When you're fighting a battle, knowledge is important. My friends, I believe America today is fighting a battle. I'd like to tell you a little story about something that happened just last year in my hometown. One of the speakers already mentioned it before me. If you're local, you may have already heard this story, but this may give you a new perspective. In January of 2015, just, just last year, my hometown of King, North Carolina, made the decision to remove all religious symbols from their veterans memorial at our local park. Again, I grew up in the city of King, so this, this hit close for home to me, close to home. So I wanted to see what this was all about. You may recall that a local man, a U.S. Army veteran, in fact, sued the city of King, stating that the religious symbols at the park allegedly violated his First Amendment constitutional rights. The legal battle lasted over four years, and in the end, the symbols were moved and King's insurance company paid half a million dollars in legal fees. Today, you will not find the Christian flag and that statue of a kneeling soldier in a cross-marked grave at our local park. King isn't the only place this is happening. It's happening in other towns as well. So what does the law really say? If we want to have knowledge, we have to study. So we did. The case in King was brought with the premise that by having religious symbols at their park, the small town of King violated this man's right through the establishment clause of the First Amendment of the Constitution. Let's take a look at that amendment, shall we? So at first glance, we see it says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. What do we see there? Congress shall make no law. It doesn't say King shall make no law. It doesn't say Yakinville shall make no law. Winston-Salem, it says Congress shall make no law. So doesn't the First Amendment restrict only Congress? How can it restrict a small town from putting up a religious statue or flag? Now a lot of folks say the courts are getting it wrong. Corruption, they're twisting the Constitution. And of course there are other defenses. These may seem logical at first. I might surprise you here with what I'm about to say, but if we're looking at the laws being recognized by the American people as valid, this judge got it exactly right. Why? Because Judge Beatty, like many judges before, recognizes that the Establishment Clause, that part of the Constitution that previously restricted only Congress, has for a very long time now been incorporated against the states and localities like King, North Carolina, by the 14th Amendment. He understands that states we have today no longer have sovereign control. 
Here are a few landmark Supreme Court cases which also use the 14th Amendment, just like they did in King. You might recognize a few of these. Roe v. Wade, 1973. Anti-abortion laws declared unconstitutional through what? Application of the 14th Amendment. Stone v. Graham, this is in 1980. Display of the Ten Commandments on the public school walls is declared unconstitutional because it violates the First Amendment by application of the 14th Amendment. Abington School District versus Shemp, school prayer is declared unconstitutional. This is the removal of school prayer because it violates the First Amendment by application of the 14th Amendment. Bostick versus Schaefer, this is a more recent case in 2013. Same-sex marriage laws struck down in the 4th District, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia. Same-sex marriage laws violate the due process and equal protection clauses through the 14th Amendment. And of course in 2015 we have King, North Carolina, which never made it to trial, but the basis behind this case and its validity that brought it to such a point was through the 14th Amendment. These cases and many more like them, they happen all around us. And all of them use the 14th Amendment as their legal foundation to apply national decisions to the states. Again, is this amendment really being mis misinterpreted by bad local decisions, bad judges, or corrupt attorneys? Or is there something more that we're missing? Let's read the first part of the 14th Amendment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Citizens of the United States. Adopted shortly after the Civil War on July 9, 1868, the 14th Amendment has been debated by scholars and historians since its inception. Many of us are probably taught that it was freely adopted in, after the Civil War to give black civil rights. But considering these cases and the variety that we have with these cases, and looking in a moment at who supported the amendment before it was passed, we start to see a different conclusion. James G. Blaine. Does anyone remember James G. Blaine from history classes? History was quite boring for me, so in recent years it's become a little bit more alive. But James Blaine was a congressman from Maine in 1861, and he was a big supporter of the 14th Amendment. He wrote in his book, Political Discussions, regarding the intention of the amendment. So if we're looking to see if this is being misused, let's look at the original intent of the 14th Amendment. He says, in making this extension of citizenship, we are not confining the breadth and scope of our efforts to the Negro. It is for the white man as well. We intend to make citizenship national. Let me read that last part once more. We intend to make citizenship national. He elaborates in his autobiography, 20 Years of Congress, as the vicious theory of state rights had been constantly at enmity with the true spirit of nationality. The organic law of the republic should be so amended that no standing room for the heresy of state rights would be left. The first section, he goes on, the first section of the 14th Constitutional Amendment, which includes these invaluable provisions, is a new charter of liberty to the citizens of the United States, and it is the utter destruction of that pestilent heresy called state rights. So Blaine is a guy who loves the idea of a national government. He was one of the biggest champions for the 14th Amendment, and here he's telling us that it not only was intended to nationalize our citizenship, but that it was to destroy the heresy of state rights. He's calling state rights a heresy. So you're probably all wondering, what's so bad about national citizenship? Don't we all call ourselves U.S. citizens? We're proud to be U.S. citizens. Haven't we always been U.S. citizens? Well, actually, no. If you go back before the Civil War, we were state citizens. If you want to understand what this means, state citizens were each loyal to their own state. This is a major difference from the way it works today. At that time, a state was a unique body of people with unique government, unique laws. States were allowed to differ on issues. Whereas today, all citizens in every state are national United States citizens whose rights, especially those most divisive issues, like we just discussed, are ultimately determined on the national stage. It's an issue with loyalty. Black's Law Dictionary defines a state 
as a self-sufficient body of persons united together in one community. What is that? A self-sufficient body of persons, a state. Today, states are no longer truly sovereign bodies because the people are no longer different. When the people of the states are the same, when people in every state are the same type of citizen, there are no state rights. Today, we're seeing all manner of frustration amongst the people because states are no longer allowed to differ on important issues. For example, if a national morality determines abortion is okay, it doesn't matter which state you live in, this decision is no longer up to the states because there are no state citizens. One major consideration with the drafting of our Constitution was whether it would be a federal or a national form of government. Of course, today we use these terms interchangeably. It's a federal government, it's a national government. These, we, we seem to think these are the same thing, but at the time they were different. The term federal re re referred to a, feder a federation of several sovereign states, with a federal government having limited control. A national government, on the other hand, was a nation of one people, one citizen under a single rule. The Federalist Papers are referred, are frequently utilized by Federalist, uh, federal judges to determine original intent of our Constitution. Federalist Paper number 39 warns us as to what we can expect when we become nationalized. This is Federalist Paper number 39. It shows original intent of our Constitution. The idea of a national government involves in it not only an authority over the individual citizens, but an indefinite supremacy over all persons and things. An indefinite supremacy over all persons and things. Isn't this what we're experiencing? Some people would have us believe that national citizens National citizenship is a necessity because without it, our states would instantly revert back to racial segregation, the elimination of individual rights. Is this true? Or rather, is our history being distorted to be used as a scare tactic for continued national indefinite supremacy over states and cities and towns like my local town of King? Should states have the sovereign power to have a moral foundation based on biblical principles if they so choose? This has been mentioned by previous uh, speakers here today. If you go to our table, you can see a listing right there. All of the states before 1867, they had religious requirements for those holding office, very stringent religious requirements. So what were the states like before? I've only told you part of the story here, and I'd love to tell you more. The remedy I propose to you today is first, education. We need to look, start looking back at what we had before we were nationalized. How we lost it, and we need to look at reestablishing it. We need to look back at when our citizenship indicated a loyalty to states first. Friends, I invite you today to join us in reopening the dialogue on American history. Let's revisit America's past with open minds and humble hearts. That's what our organization, America's Remedy, is all about. Please visit our table. We want leaders in our community. We want local law enforcement. We want pastors. We want teachers. We want homes, homeschool teachers to know and understand this important history. We want you to understand that this is a moral and just cause. If you find this information interesting and you want to know more, We've got an excellent opportunity coming up next, uh, next month, August 13th. It's the second Saturday in August in my hometown of King, North Carolina. Our speaker, founder, John Ainsworth, is going to be speaking. If you've never heard John Ainsworth speak, I highly recommend that you come and, uh, and come and enjoy some barbecue with us. We're going to actually have a meal before that. Uh, come and enjoy some fellowship and time of learning. Like I said, before you leave today, please come by our, our booth and uh, grab a flyer. And, and learn a little bit more about what we're about. Friends, if there's one thing I could leave you with today, it would be this. Let's not be destroyed for lack of knowledge. Thank you.